Hi, my name is Jo Porter and I'm a specialist dietitian at um, University Hospitals Bristol and Western NHS Foundation Trust. And I work with people who've been diagnosed with cancer. So today I'm going to talk a little bit about um, eating well um, and how that can be adapted if you're having eating difficulties. Um, and I'll also touch on eating at the end of life and I'll be able to signpost you to some um, potentially some useful resources um, and to our website, but also some help available if you'd like to, to see a dietitian for a more personalised approach. Hopefully today you'll go away with some useful tips to help you managing any side effects of treatment um, or of cancer. So I get asked a lot, what should I eat? Should I be eating any particular foods? Should I be eating more of one food or, or less of another? Should I be taking any nutritional supplements? And that's totally understandable because making changes to our diet can sometimes help bring a sense of control um, and can also help, help us to feel like we're doing something for ourselves. The trouble is that there's so much information available on the internet, in books, and out there that it can be and some of that information can be quite conflicting so that can leave people feeling quite confused and they don't know what to do for the best for themselves it's really important to know that there's never a need to follow a restrictive diet or cut out a particular food group unless that's a recommendation made by a healthcare professional or by a dietitian and they'll usually advise you on how to make um how to choose alternative foods um, so that your diet doesn't become restrictive. What the evidence actually tells us is that people with cancer and with advanced cancers um, would ideally eat a balanced diet as possible. But they're all, also their energy and their protein requirements might be a bit higher than the general population. And so sometimes our diets need to be adapted to help us meet the needs. And we know that eating well can help us cope with treatments, um, can help maintain our strength, and concentration, and that can all help with our quality of life as well. So if you're someone who's eating well, has a good appetite, and maintaining your weight, then we would recommend following a balanced diet. And a balanced diet means eating a, a variety of different foods from each of these food groups. So firstly, we would recommend trying to eat lots of fruits and vegetables, and aiming for five portions a day in total if that's possible. And that can include any that are fresh, frozen, tinned, canned, ready prepared, even dried fruit and fresh and fruit juice can count as, a, as one of your five a day. We'd also recommend in, um, to, to base about a third of your diet on starchy carbohydrates. Um, and that will include bread, rice, pasta, potatoes and cereals. Ideally, you choose whole grain um, varieties um, as these can help maintain our gut health and can help our bowels move regularly. But they also leave us feeling fuller for longer and help to sustain our energy levels. As I said, protein requirements can be a little bit higher when you have cancer. So we'd recommend trying to have a source of protein with each of your meals if you can. And that might include things like dairy foods, meat, fish, eggs, beans and pulses, um, or, dairy, um, or vegetarian alternatives such as um, corn and soya. If you do eat fish, then we would recommend having, trying to have two portions a week, with one of those being oily fish. So that will be things like salmon or mackerel, trout, or, um, pilchards or sardines. And that will help you obtain your omega-3 fatty acids, which is an essential fatty acid um, and is particularly important for our, our heart health and our, our blood vessels and for inflammation in the body. And next, we'd recommend trying to have two to three portions of, um, of dairy foods or dairy alternatives, um, such as milk and yogurts and cheese or plant milks um, or yogurts instead. Try to make sure that if you are having a plant-based milk, that you have one that is fortified with calcium and vitamin B12, because that's not um, naturally occurring in those foods. And also be aware that um, not all of the um, dairy alternative milks are equivalent in protein to cow's milk. So actually soya milk is that has the highest protein content, but nut and oat milks tend to be very low in protein and low in calories. You can see here that the, the oils and spreads group is really quite small, and that's because we don't need very much of these foods to get um, all that our body needs. Um, it's best to choose, um, 
choose oils and spreads that are um, based on olive oil or rapeseed oils as these are rich in, in um, unsaturated fats and are healthier for our hearts. On the outside of the chart here, you'll see the foods that tend to be a little bit higher in, in fat and in sugar and in um, salt. Then they don't contain um, any particular essential nutrients that aren't provided by those foods on the plate. They do taste good and they are part of, um, they can still be part of our, our um, diets. Um, what we would recommend is the, to keep these foods to an occasional treat uh, or have every now and again um, if you're trying to, to maintain a healthy weight. And lastly, fluid is really, really important for our hydration, for our kidney health, but also for concentration. And we'd recommend that you have six to eight glasses of um, fluids a day, and that will include water, um, squashes, sugar-free drinks, low-fat milk, uh, and teas and coffees as well. And that equates to about one and a half to two litres of fluid a day. What happens if eating becomes more difficult? We know that um, you know certain that some cancers and cancer treatments can make eating a little bit more difficult, and at this time you may need to relax some of those healthy eating messages we've just talked about, and that will allow you to get the fuel that your body needs. If you are experiencing um, particular symptoms like nausea, diarrhea, constipation, or dry mouth, it's really worth speaking to your healthcare professional, your doctor or your nurse, um, to see if there's any way of treating those symptoms. They may be able to prescribe medications to help you manage those, which inevitably will, will help you eat a little bit better. People often feel really quite disappointed and frustrated when they can't manage to eat very much or are eating less than normal for them. Try and focus more on what you have managed than what you haven't managed to eat and take the pressure off. Hopefully I'll go through some tips now of um, ways to manage some of these eating difficulties and these side effects of treatments. Um, and so hopefully you'll go away with some tips um, and some practical um, things to try. So firstly, having a reduced appetite is really quite common um, due to the side effects of treatments and the cancer itself can kickstart um, the release of some hormones which can suppress the appetite and leave us feeling fuller for longer um, and, and full more quickly. Some people will find having a large meal, such as the one on this picture, really off-putting um, and, and you know, if faced with that, might not eat very much. However, what most people find is that actually if they've served a smaller portion or maybe that their meal is a smaller portion on a, a smaller plate, like a, a side plate or a tea plate, or that they're eating more um, sort of finger foods, buffet style foods, they sometimes find that they eat a little bit more that way as it seems it looks more achievable um, and, and less daunting to them. Sometimes people feel hungry at different times of the day. So, for instance, if you're used to having your evening, you know, your large meal in the evening, then you may find um, and you find that your appetite is better, say, at lunchtime, then do swap it around. We don't have to be bound by our normal dietary habits and actually being a bit more flexible might help you to enjoy eating a bit more. What can sometimes be helpful is to choose softer, easy to chew foods as they can be a little bit less tiring um, and um, can be quicker and easier to eat and swallow. And if you do feel particularly tired, if you're feeling fatigued and actually cooking, standing up to cook takes a lot of your energy. And by the time you get to, to eat that food, you feel worn, up, worn out and, you, and you're not hungry anymore. Then you might find it useful to, to maybe buy some ready meals or use a meal delivery service like Wiltshire Farm Foods or Oak House Farm Foods or even or Cook. Um, there's lots of them out there. Um, and those companies and, and also supermarkets do sometimes do a sort of mini meal range so you can buy uh, ready meals in smaller portions and sometimes people find that quite useful too. So when you are eating smaller portions it's really important to make the most of every mouthful, to make every mouthful count. You can do this by adding high calorie and high protein foods to your meals and that might be something like adding cream or croutons to a soup um, it could be grating cheese on top of your vegetables or on top of baked beans. Um, it could be something like adding a bit of extra butter and cream to your mashed potatoes. Or when you have fruit, having ice cream and custard or cream with it, um, just to help boost, boost the nourishment of, of those snacks or meals. 
Even adding something like mayonnaise or salad cream, salad dressings to, me to a meal can make it more nourishing. You could also fortify your milk by adding four to five tablespoons of dried skim milk powder to a pint of milk and then use that milk to have on your cereals, to make any milky drinks or any sauces or custards throughout the day and that will help to boost your protein intake as well. You can make quite a bit of a difference if you're doing these small things across each of your meals. Um, it, can, it can increase the nourishment of the meals without increasing the bulk too much. What can also be helpful is, is to have lots of nourishing snacks throughout the day. And some people find it a lot more comfortable to maybe have four to six small meals or snacks spread throughout the day, maybe every two to three hours. That can feel a lot more comfortable and a little less bloating for some people. High energy snacks are a really good idea. Forget about the low fat, low calorie foods. Go for those ones that you enjoy. Um, perhaps the sort of naughty foods that you've been once told to avoid. That's Now's a good time to have those. Try to keep the snacks as well in a room that you spend most time. So for some people that might be putting some nuts or some crisps or biscuits on the, on the side table next to your armchair while you're watching, watching TV. That can act as a visual reminder um, to eat, but also it helps you save some energy um, rather than going out in search for food. Nourishing drinks can also um, be really helpful as they're not they're often not as filling as, and tiring as, as eating. Um, so you could try and have a couple of nourishing drinks spread throughout the day. You could try things like milky drinks, such as um, milky coffees or hot chocolates or uh, malted drinks, um, or something like smoothies and fruit juices are also really refreshing and nourishing too. You can buy some um, supplement drinks that have added um, vitamins and minerals and also contain calories and protein um, from supermarkets and from the chemist. Um, and some of the brands you might see around would be things like Complan or Meritine, um, Huel or Nourishment. But you can also get supplements on prescription, um, especially if you're struggling to eat or finding that you're losing weight without trying. And if you'd like to explore that a bit more, then I'd recommend speaking to your GP um, or to a specialist nurse. Um, and you can also ask for a referral to a dietitian and I'll go through how to, to um, organise that later. In terms of, sort of side effects that can be treatable, things like um, nausea, um, it can be quite common. It's really important to speak to your healthcare professionals about the nausea that you're getting, um, as they may be able to recommend some anti-sickness medications. And some of those ones can be timed sort of 20 to 30 minutes before having a meal um, to help you feel a little less sick while you're eating. If there are particular triggers, um, so for example, some people find that they may feel more nauseous if they feel particularly hot or food smells might trigger their nausea. If that's the case, then, then eating in a room that's well ventilated, that has maybe the windows open um, to keep it nice and cool can be helpful. You may also prefer to have colder foods um, or room temperature foods as they have produced less smells as well. Having an empty stomach can also um, make people feel quite nauseous. And most of the time they'll notice that perhaps first thing in the morning when they've just woken up. And so starting the day maybe with some um, dry biscuits or toast or crackers can sometimes help to set, uh, settle the stomach. And sometimes people also find things like ginger flavoured foods and drinks um, or peppermint um, drinks can sometimes also help to settle the stomach. So you might want to try something like ginger ale or, or ginger biscuits, um, perhaps, um, or ginger tea to help settle your stomach. Taste changes and dry mouth, again, are another common side effect. Firstly, it's really important to drink plenty, to brush your teeth regularly, and that can include brushing your tongue as well. And that can um, really help to keep your mouth fresh. If you're using a mouthwash, then I'd recommend using one that doesn't have alcohol in it, as sometimes alcohol can dry the mouth as well. People with a dry mouth often tell me that they really struggle with bread or pastry and, and particularly meat as well. And they might find that food sort of sticks around their mouth a bit more when they're eating, making it a bit more tricky to, to swallow or clear their mouth after each mouthful. You might find having a little sip of water um, or fluid of your choice um, during meal times. You could also um, try to add sauces and gravies to your food or cook, the meat, cook your meat in those um, in sauces and gravies to keep the moisture. 
Even things like adding salad dressings or olive oil um, can make food easier to, to chew and to, to swallow. If you're missing a sandwich, which a lot of people do, then I'd recommend maybe having a sandwich with thinly sliced bread and a wet filling, something like tuna mayonnaise or egg mayonnaise, uh, cottage cheese or, or something like avocado can help keep the moisture in the sandwich and make it easier to eat. Also using, you know, having a cheese sandwich and dunking that into some soup can be quite, um, quite nice too. Again, if you do struggle with meat, um, then I'd recommend trying some minced meat or corned beef. And you may also find things like vegetarian alternatives like um, mint um, corn or soya mints um, or fish and eggs are often easier to chew, to swallow as well. And in terms of helping to stimulate your saliva, you might find that things like sucking on mints or chewing gum um, or boiled sweets between meals can help, can help keep your, your mouth moist. And there's also things of um, artificial salivas and sprays available on prescription or in the chemists. Um, and they can provide a really quick, fast relief um, to dryness. And that could be quite helpful maybe over night time um, if you're waking up with a dry mouth. And you can speak to your GP about different ones that are available on prescription if you'd like. Taste changes are really, really common as well, especially if you're having chemotherapies um, or radiotherapy to the mouth. And some people will describe a metallic taste with, um, with different chemotherapies, uh, metal-based chemotherapies. And you may find in that instance that using plastic or bamboo cutlery um, or favor and trying to avoid maybe having too many tinned foods or canned, food, canned drinks if you notice that they taste particularly metallic. Also, marinating foods and meats um, can, can help to improve the flavour and mask a metallic taste. Often people will describe a sort of a bland or a cardboard or a cotton taste in the mouth. Um, and if that's the case, then adding lots of strong flavours like herbs and spices um, or squeezing lemon or lime onto foods can really help to enhance the flavours um, for our taste buds to recognise. You could also use strong tasting um, condiments, so things like horseradish or mustard, mint sauce or red currant jelly, sweet chilli sauce or soy sauce um, or different chutneys just to help pep up the meal. And often people find that that can be really helpful. Using a combination of flavours together, even if they don't feel like they go, maybe having sweet and savoury foods together can sometimes help um, enhance flavour as well. <clears throat> And you can download, if you'd like some more information on these topics, you can download our resources from the website and I'll, I'll show that link later on. Sometimes the symptoms that we've just mentioned can impact on the amount that we can eat and can cause weight loss. In these cases, making some simple dietary changes, as we just discussed, can help to um, stabilise weight. However, regaining weight can be a bit more challenging. And sometimes despite making these changes, some people will still lose weight. And that can be because the body's higher nutritional needs, meaning that the en more energy is used than saved for our body's tissues and muscles. Towards the end of life, losing weight can be a natural part of that process. At this point, we, we need to stop worrying about weight um, weighing yourselves and try to focus on pleasure and comfort um, of eating instead. If you're worried about losing weight, then please do speak to your healthcare professional and you can always ask to be referred to a dietitian. Towards the end of life, people generally experience a loss of appetite or interest in eating and can lose weight. This can be really worrying for families and carers, but it is a natural part and a natural and expected part of the dying process. Most people at the end of the life don't feel hungry or thirst. The body is slowing down, so it sometimes so someone eats or drinks more than they really want or need, then it can cause them a little bit of discomfort. Families and carers may be concerned about the effects of reduced food intake or dehydration on the person that's dying. And it's it's totally natural for families to want to continue providing nourishment at this time. Eating and drinking at this time is more about pleasure and comfort and, and it's not necessarily not necessary for the diet to be nutritionally complete. Concentrate on foods that are enjoyed in amounts that feel comfortable instead. It might be helpful for, to offer drinks in small cups or glasses and if the person is only managing half a glass at a the time they still might find it easier to have a full glass. 
And so that means that they don't have to tip their head back so so far when they drink and it can help make e swallowing easier. Also have a conversation about sort of what will be helpful for that person. And it might be that, you know, food and food and eating is, is not something they find pleasurable anymore. And there are other ways that you can can help them find some pleasure. Maybe that's sort of reading to them, sitting with them, having a conversation, watching a film or some gentle massage. And those can be different ways to show that you love and care when food is no longer um, an interest. You may also find it reassuring and helpful to speak to a healthcare professional rather than going through this alone. And your GP, clinical nurse specialist or hospice nurse um, can be particularly useful to speak to. So I wanted to end with this picture. Sometimes we need to shift the goalposts a little so that we can remain flexible to our needs at that time. Sometimes the usual healthy eating messages have to go out the window and a focus that's more around what you can tolerate, what's least effort and what's most enjoyable is really important for you. If you would like to speak to, to a dietitian about your eating and nutrition, if you've got any particular questions, then we, are, um, we have dietitians at Bristol and at Western who can help support you. We're running clinics um, and at the moment, mostly telephone and video clinics um, and some face to face. And that means that we can still see you. Um, we can still speak to you while you're at home in your own home. You can have a get a referral to a dietitian by downloading our self referral form from the website um, or, and sending it back to us. Or you can ask for a healthcare professional to refer you on your behalf. If you would like to have a look for some more information, some more resources, then we've got loads available on our website. Um, and I've also provided some extra websites here for reputable um, sources of information and also some recipes um, if, you, if you're interested in those. And on this page, we have some websites that can be particularly useful to communicate your needs to your family and friends, um, or it might be to, to update people on how your treatment's going and, and how you're feeling. Um, it can also be a way to coordinate care for some people as well. Or it just might be for, for communication, for conversation. Thank you very much for taking the time to listen today, and I hope you've found some useful information there. Please remember that we are here to help.